Amen. So again, Jesus, he said there, if your brother sins against you, he said, go and tell him his fault. Now, in recent weeks, we have seen that as peacemakers, we should fight for what's right. We have seen that we should be advocates of one another as well. We should stand by each other. When we see one another, when we see one that is done unjustly, we should be there for them, shouldn't we? And so here in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, where we read responsibly from the 15th, 15th verse through the 27th verse, but all the way down to the 35th verse as well, we'll see that Jesus, that he speaks to one of our main duties as being a peacemaker in this world. Jesus, he speaks to our duty as being a keeper of the peace. You and I, we are to be keepers of peace. And so the question that came from the mouth of Peter there in the 21st verse is a question that I think that, that many of us we would ask today when we are wronged by somebody. Peter, he asked there in the 21st verse, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How often have you ever thought about that? How often have you ever wondered how many times am I going to have to forgive this guy? How, am I, how many times am I going to have to forgive her? How many times am I going to have to put up with, with their mess? How often have you thought about that one? Don't lie to me. Y'all awfully quiet, but I know we think about that one. And see, I think that Peter, he was asking that question from the same place that many of us ask that question today. And we're sitting there and we're wondering that. The truth of the matter is that at some point in time, most of us, we have been mistreated. The truth of the matter is that at some point in time, we have all been done wrong. We've been dead dirty. That's what we'll say, ain't it? And those wrongs, they have left their wounds on us, haven't they? They often wound us physically. They wound us mentally. We can't let it go right. They, they wound us emotionally, don't they? When you get wrong, you, I know you that you are emotionally wounded. And, and they wound us, they wound us in our soul. They wound us, they wound us spiritually as well. And so even though we know that, that we should forgive, there is a growing movement today against forgiveness. As I have said in the past, forgiveness, it is often portrayed as a sign of weakness. And the reason why some believe that forgiveness is a sign of weakness is because it's seen as doing nothing, doing nothing about it, right? Doing nothing when, when somebody done, done did you wrongly when somebody done used you, when, when somebody have abused you, it's seen as doing nothing if, if, you, if you move to forgive them. So we have become slow to forgive today. We're slow to forgive those who have repeatedly used us. We are slow to forgive those who abuse us. We are slow to forgive those who have taken advantage of us, aren't we? Again, we, we often think, how many times don't we? Then there are the other ones who we just don't like. And when they do us wrong, we forgiveness don't even come to our mind, does it? You know, there are quite a few today that will say, man, I'm never forgiving that guy. Say, I'm never forgiving that person. Does that sound proper? Is it proper for, for all of us who are supposed to be God's children to, to say we will never forgive somebody? It's not proper for us as God's children, especially when we know that we have a role to serve in the world today as a peacemaker. We are supposed to be keepers of peace. 
You know, when Peter wondered if seven times was enough times to forgive somebody there, we'll see there that Jesus, he shook his head. The scripture tells us there in the 22nd verse that Jesus, he said to Peter, I do not say to you up to seven times. Many of us, we've heard this one before, haven't we? Jesus said to Peter up to 70 times seven. Now seven, that was the number that was traditionally believed to be the appropriate number of times that one should be forgiven by the law. But the Mosaic law, it never set a number for how many times one should be forgiven. Do you think that Jesus has given us a set number of times that we should forgive somebody? Now there from the 23rd through the 27th verse, we'll see that Jesus, he taught us a very important parable about forgiveness. He's teaching it to us through the disciples. The parable, it begins with Jesus saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who desired to settle the debts his servants owed him. And we'll see there in that scripture that there was a certain servant who owed the king 10,000 talents. That is an absurd amount of money if we were to equate it to our day. And so because the servant couldn't pay back his debts, we'll see there that the king commanded that, that the servant be sold, but not only that he be sold, but that his wife and his children, all that he owed the servant, the king said, should be sold so that the king could receive back what was owed to him. Now this command, as we look at that scripture there, we'll see that it caused the servant to cry out, didn't it? Imagine that. Imagine you owing so much money that you could not pay it back. And the king said, we are going to sell you we are going to sell your wife. We are going to sell your child. You will never see them again. We are going to sell away all that you owe. How would that make you feel? For the servant, it caused him to cry out. The servant, he cried out and he pleaded for the king to have patience with him. He said to the king, I can get it back. Just, just give me time. This servant, he was begging for mercy, wasn't he? Have you ever had to beg for mercy? I don't know about you, but I have. I, I've had to cry out for, for, for mercy. Now we'll see there that the king, he chose to have compassion on the servant and by his compassions, he forgave, he erased all that the servant owed him. That's a mighty kind king, isn't it? I think it is. Now this parable that, that Jesus has, has shared here to the disciples, he shared it to us through the disciples again. It speaks of the Lord. It speaks of how God has forgiven us, how he has erased our debts. Many of us, we, we don't realize this, but, but we are in terrible debt to the Lord. You see, God, he gave us his only begotten son and he gave us his only begotten son for a reason, right? He gave his only begotten son to be our propitiation because again, we transgress against God. We, we sin against the Lord. We disobey his instructions when we should be following him. We aren't always following him. Are we God? He will direct us to go this way. And too many of us, we go, Oh, I'm going that way. And so because we are sinners in our nature, right? He gave us his only begotten son, amen? amen? And his only begotten son gave his life for us. There is a depth that we would owe. 
gave his only begotten son who still shows us mercy today because, again, we are not perfect. We still fall down into error. We fall into temptation. We still transgress God. But again, the Lord is merciful to us today. When we cry out to God, he gives us time to get right, doesn't he? Just imagine if God, if he was like us. Just imagine if God struggled to forgive us of all of our wrongdoings, of all of our disobedience. Just imagine if God was like how we are. When when we begin to wonder, how many times am I going to have to forgive this person? How many times am I going to have to forgive them? How many times am I going to have to forgive them of abusing me, of them using me? Imagine if God was like that to us. Because there are many of us who try to use God day by day, don't we? Thinking that we get over on the Lord. What shape would we be in today in our soul if God was like us? We are healed today in our soul because the Lord, he loves us, doesn't he? We are healed in our soul today because of God's mercy. We are forgiven today because, again, God, he loves us and he is a merciful God. As Andrew said in our Sunday school lesson today, it is in his nature. If God, if he did not forgive us, the pain and the shame of our wrongs, they would crush us in our soul. I ask you now, do you see why we must move in forgiveness today? While I may not be able to forgive somebody of their transgressions against God, Jesus has said to us today that when our brother sins against us, we should forgive them. We must understand today that there is great power in forgiveness because forgiveness, it helps us to breathe easier. Forgiveness, it helps us to be able to live as well. Because God forgives us, we are able to be at peace in our soul. Because God forgives us, we are able to live in harmony with the Lord. Are you living in harmony with God today? And so because God forgives us, we are able to flourish. Because God forgives us, we are blessed. Are you blessed today? So, again, the question, it now arises there in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. How should we move towards those that wrong us? Should we hold on to that thought of how many times am I going to have to forgive this person? And, again, the, the, the question has been answered. But if you turn with me over into the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel, and you take a look at the 38th and the 45th, through the 44th verse there. Jesus, we will see he explained something that is very important for us and how we should deal with those that, that move against us. There in the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel, verse 38 through 44, Jesus, he explained that we must first keep our peace. When someone moves against us, we must Keep our peace. Jesus, he said to the disciples, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Many of us, we we live by that motto, don't we? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you do me wrong, I'm going to get you back. It's how many of us live today. But Jesus, he said to the disciples there in the 38th and the 39th verse, He said, I tell you not to resist an evil person. So in other words, they weren't supposed to return evil for evil. 
Jesus, he then said there in the 39th verse, if someone slapped them, if someone slapped the disciples, the disciples, they should have turned the other cheek. Rather than returning evil for evil, Jesus, he said there in the 43rd verse, he said to them that they should love their enemy. How many of us are loving our enemies today? And Jesus, he did went on to say there that the disciples were to bless those that cursed them. The disciples were to do good to those that hated them. They were to also pray for those that spitefully used them. They were to pray for those that even persecuted them as well. How many of us are doing that today? Oh, I can get nothing now. I guess we ain't doing that today, are we? Are you a disciple of Christ today? Well, I got a mumble, yes. Are you following Christ today? Hmm. I don't know. Some of y'all must not be following today. See, the principle Jesus taught the 12, that's a principle for the disciples of today. If you say that you are a child of God, if you say that you love Jesus, if you say that you are following him, this principle, these principles there in the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel, they are still meant for you to live by today. Oh, boy. Now, many of you, you may say, Pastor, I ain't going out like that if somebody do me wrong. Oh, boy, how many of us saying that or thinking that in our head right now? I ain't going out like that. They do me wrong. I ain't going out that way, Pastor. I feel that we need to think about the consequences of our actions if we choose to move differently, if we choose to answer evil with our own evil, if we choose to answer hate with our own hate. See, we know that returning evil for evil, we know that it would do nothing but produce more evil, right? We must understand that there is more at stake in life than returning evil for evil. And I want you to hear that clearly. There is more at stake then you returning evil for evil. Now, some of us, we may begin to wonder, well, pastor, well, what is it that is at stake? Well, first off, I would tell you that your soul is at stake. To fully understand what is at stake, I think that many of us, we need to consider today who our enemy is, and I think that we need to consider what it is that our enemy is trying to do to us. Do you know who your enemy is today? See, our enemy wants to defeat us, doesn't he? We know that our enemy wants to defeat us, but what are we going to do about it? Are you going to let your enemy defeat you today? See, our enemy, he wants to, to make us break. He wants us to snap in our soul. Have you ever considered that? See, when you return evil with your own evil, I tell you today that our enemy has gotten the best of you. When you answer hate with hate, our enemy has gotten exactly what he wants. I don't know if you hear me here today, but again, when you move that way against what who has moved that way against you, your enemy has beaten you. Your enemy has gotten the best of you. Your enemy has gotten exactly what he has desired and wanted. You see, your enemy has gotten you to act out of character. And your enemy rejoices when you act out of character. Not only has your enemy gotten you to act out of character, but your enemy has gotten you to move against the spirit as well. How many of us moving against the spirit today? 
Your enemy has gotten you to move against the spirit. Your enemy has gotten you to move against the principles of Christ. Your enemy has gotten you to move against God. How many of us today, because we refuse to move in forgiveness, how many of us are moving against God and doing exactly what our enemy wants us to do today? We are supposed to be keepers of peace. How many of us are keepers of peace today? Now, something we must get right today is the fact that we are meant to move by grace. We are not meant to move by wrath today. We're not meant to move by anger. And so there in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, Jesus' focus is on the believer, again, moving to be a keeper of peace and not a stirrer of wrath. I hope you hear me here today. You are not supposed to be stirring up a whole bunch of mess. If you are a child of God, you're not supposed to be keeping up a whole bunch of fuss. You're not supposed to be creating a whole bunch of hysteria. You are supposed to be making for peace. Not only should you be making for peace, you should be trying to keep the peace. Oh, I don't get no amen on that. And so again, there in my key verse, Jesus, he said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. We must learn the way of forgiveness today. And the way of forgiveness there, Jesus said, it begins by telling your brother his fault between, he said there, you and him. And he said, alone. I want to be very clear about this. Jesus was telling us that we should rebuke our brother, that we should rebuke those that have wronged us. You see, too often, when we have been wrong, many of us, we, we choose to, to keep silent. We choose not to say a word because we think that if we say something to somebody that has wronged us, that would be us keeping up a whole bunch of mess. But how are we keeping up a bunch of mess when we are the one that was done wrongly? I tell you today that, that you cannot, nor should you ever listen to me. You should never keep silent when somebody has done you wrongly, when somebody has mistreated you, when somebody has used you, when somebody is abusing you, you need to rebuke them. You need to let them know. If you don't let them know, guess what happens? They're just going to keep right on doing what they've been doing. And guess who is the one that is hurting? It definitely ain't them, is it? It's us. Does that sound like it's healthy for your soul? Let's consider today how we feel when somebody has wronged us. You know, there are times I think some of us, when we are wrong, some of us will say, "Ah, oh, well, it, it didn't hurt me. It didn't do anything to me. We'll say it doesn't bother me when they have wronged us and we, we remain silent. We say, oh, it didn't, it didn't hurt me. It didn't wrong me. It didn't, it didn't do anything to me. Now, I suppose that's mature, uh, you know, if, if you if it really didn't hurt you. But a lot of times, many of us, we are hurting and we'll say, ah, it didn't really hurt me. You are now lying to yourself. Some of us, we may say, well, well it wasn't that bad what they did to me. We start making excuses for the wrongdoer. It wasn't that bad. It didn't really hurt. The whole time we have been wounded in our soul and, and we're hurting in our soul. 
See, if we're being honest with ourselves, nobody likes to be mistreated. And again, if we're being honest with ourselves, when we are mistreated, it can hurt us and it can anger us as well. It can frustrate us. It can upset us as well. When we are wrong and it leads to the anger building up inside of us, if we don't let somebody know that they have wronged us, that anger, it can quickly turn into bitterness, can it? And if we let that bitterness, if we let bitterness dwell within us, that bitterness, it can turn into wrath, can't it? As Paul said in his letter to the church of Ephesus, we should not let the sun go down on our wrath. In other words, if you have been wronged and you remain silent, it can poison your soul with wrath. And that's something that we as God's children, that's not something that we should allow to happen. As James said, the wrath of man, that does not produce the righteousness of God. How can we keep the peace? How can we make for peace if we let wrath bubble up inside of us. How can we do what is right for somebody if wrath is dwelling in a side of us? We cannot make for peace, nor can we ever keep the peace if we're letting wrath dwell in us. When you let someone know that they have wronged you, I tell you again today that this helps you to breathe a whole lot easier. And that is healthy for your soul. When somebody wronged you, you let them know. You tell them that they have wronged you. Now notice there again, there in my key verse, there in the 15th verse, that Jesus, he said that this initial rebuke, he said that it should be done in private. He said there, it should be between you and the one that has wronged you alone. Forgiveness, we should always remember, it's about making for and trying to keep the peace. Therefore, you don't have to make a show in your rebuking of somebody. You know, we get around, we like to make a show, don't we? If, if somebody wronged us and we want to let them know that they have wronged us, and if it's a whole bunch of people around, oh, we're going to make a show of it. Would you want somebody doing that to you? Because again, who in this room is perfect? Raise your hand. Keep my hands down. We, even though we have been wrong, we, we shouldn't start acting out of character, should we? we? We must remember the golden rule. Jesus said that whatever you want someone to do to you, hey, you better turn around and also do to them as well. When you roll somebody, you ain't going to want them to make a show about you, are you? If I have wronged you, pull me to the side and I will do the same for you. That is how, again, we make for peace. That is how we keep peace as well. See, the keepers of peace, we should be civil. The keepers of peace, we should be amicable as well. And Jesus, he then said there again in my key verse there in the 15th verse, he said that if your brother, if your fellow man hears you, he said, you have gained your brother. If he hears, that means that your brother was attentive to your words, right? Mm -hmm. They acknowledge your words, right? They acknowledge your rebuke, right? Not only did they acknowledge your rebuke, but they actually put forth the effort to correct the wrong that they had did to you, right? To me, this is so important, that acknowledgement, the acknowledgement of, of doing wrong. You see, I, I, I say today that if there was simply a, an, an acknowledgement 
of, of someone, the wrongdoer, saying and admitting that they did the wrong, the world, I believe, I truly do believe, the world will be in a whole lot better of a place. However, as we know, some folks, they are too stubborn to ever acknowledge that they did anything wrong, aren't they? You see, some folks, they perfect. They don't never mess up, do they? You see, some folks, they perfect. They, they, they don't believe that they have to go to God in, in forgiveness. Nonetheless, it will go to you to be forgiven of anything that they did because they ain't did nothing, have they? This lack of acknowledging wrongs is why there are protests today. Oh, my, somebody ain't going to hear that. This acknowledging, uh, this lack of acknowledging wrongs, I should say, is why there is a whole bunch of civil unrest today. This lack of acknowledging wrongs is, is why there is mass hysteria in the world today. Why there is much anger in the world today. So what should we do when someone ignores our rebuke? When they aren't attentive, when they don't acknowledge that they did any wrong? Is that the moment in time when we should breathe out smoke and fire? Brother Harris said no. Jesus, he said there in the 16th verse, in a word of encouragement, he said that you should go and find at least, at least two or three witnesses. Go and find a group to, to help you with the one that has wronged you. This is a moment where we see the keepers of peace, us, fulfilling the role of one that is a mediator. A mediator is one that intervenes between two warring parties, between two disputing parties, to resolve an ongoing dispute. We should be spiritual mediators today if we are going to be peacemakers, if we are going to be keepers of the peace. The spiritual mediator should be able to help establish the truth of a matter. A spiritual mediator should approach any dispute without bias. Oh boy. A spiritual mediator should help to establish a resolution that again makes for peace or again keeps the peace. But again, we know that some folks, they are so stubborn that if you bring two or three with you, they're going to ignore the two or three that you done brought with you as well, aren't they? What then? What should we do then if they're still not acknowledging what they did was wrong. Are we supposed to forgive them? Are we supposed to? Is that the time where we should breathe out that smoke and fire? Should we let that anger flow? Should we let our wrath go on them then? No. Now, since Jesus was teaching about forgiving a brother or a sister in Christ, we'll see there in the 17th verse that Jesus, he said, go to the church. Take it to the church. But if this person, if they still refuse to acknowledge their wrongs, to repent of their wrongdoing against you, their transgressions against you, their sin against you, Jesus, he said there, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. He said there, now heathens and tax collectors, they were not well loved, which often led to them having to hang out with each other. Tax collectors would hang out with tax collectors. Heathens would hang out with heathens. Other folks wouldn't have anything to do with them. They would have very little to do with them. You see, sometimes the best way for you to keep the peace is for you to know when to let unhealthy people to go out of your life. As Brian Harris said, sometimes you just have to let them go. You have to let it go. See, that, that's healthy for, ask me after the sermon. I'll get you, Brad. That is what is healthy for the soul. Now, pay close attention to the fact that Jesus, he didn't tell us to still forgive that stubborn person there in that verse. Pay close attention to it. Jesus, he did not say that you should still forgive that person. 
See, that person, they haven't earned your forgiveness. They didn't acknowledge that they did anything wrong, and they didn't try to put forth the effort to correct what they did wrongly to you. So why should you forgive them? Jesus did not say that you should still forgive them. You see, too often we hurt our own soul by forgiving people who haven't earned our forgiveness. I don't know if you heard that. This is the reason why so many people today are under the impression that that forgiveness that is pointless, that forgiveness, it does not work. And I tell you today, I agree with you. Improper forgiveness, it does not work. When you just give away your forgiveness freely, when they haven't earned your forgiveness, yeah, it does not work. When you haven't let somebody know that they have wronged you, yeah, it's not going to work. They're not going to forgive you. They're going to keep on keeping on and abusing and using you. Something else that I sadly also notice is that we often try to appease those who have wronged us. Those who haven't earned our forgiveness. We say, I'm going to give them another chance and, and, and maybe they'll do right this time around. We again, we give that forgiveness away and, and we try to do right by them for them to again, just keep on using us and abusing us. The only thing that this has done for us is to cause more unrest in our soul, to disturb us, to remove our peace from us. Forgiveness without the wrongdoer's acknowledgement and sincere repentance, I want you to understand today, that is not forgiveness. So why do we choose to harm ourselves in such a manner by freely giving away what doesn't belong to the wrongdoer? Oh boy. See, there is supposed to be healing in forgiveness. I tell you today that there is healing in forgiveness when it is based on Jesus's principles of forgiveness. When you move according to his way, God's way of forgiveness, there is healing in God's forgiveness. So because we know the forgiveness of Christ, I tell you today that we, the keepers of peace, we must teach others the way of Jesus's principles on forgiveness. We have to start turning our brothers and our sisters. We have to start turning them away from the way of improper forgiveness so that they can find peace in their soul. I don't know if you hear me here. You see, there are many souls today that are filled with such unrest because of what someone has done to them. And I say to you today that we should help them out in finding their rebuke of the one that has wronged them so that they can again obtain their peace. When you let somebody know that they have wronged you, that's all you need. And if they don't forgive you, that's on them. But you have at least let them know. There are many more who are in despair today because they were treated so poorly. They was done unjustly. They gave their rebuke, but the person chose to ignore their rebuke and continued to, to abuse them in doing them wrongly. I say to you today that as keepers of peace, as peacemakers, we must become a mediator in our time of need. We must help the one that is wrong. We must help them again find their voice. And at times we must be their voice so that we can again help them to be able to find peace. Then again, there are many more today who are again hurting in their soul because they are actually the wrongdoer that has not been forgiven. And we rarely think about this, this group of people, but there are many wrongdoers today who are being crushed by the guilt of their sin, who are being crushed by the shame of their transgressions. You know, we often have mistreated people 
And later on in that day or that night, we started thinking about what we did to that person and we start to feel so embarrassed, don't we? To where hopefully we are hoping that that person will forgive us. But there are times where they may not forgive us. What should we do? I tell you today that those who are a wrongdoer and they have repented of their wrongdoing, we should not let them suffer in their wrongdoing. That is not the way of a peacemaker, is it? To let somebody suffer in their wrongs, in their pain and in their hurt, to let them be weighed down by guilt and shame and by sin. See, I don't know about you, but I believe that all people deserve rest in their soul today. You may not agree with me, but I am standing by the word of God. If God will forgive me of my sins, and again, if he will forgive you of your many sins, then we should certainly forgive one who has repented of their sins against us. Remember, Jesus, he told Peter that we should be willing to always forgive. Jesus said 70 times seven. Over in the 17th chapter of Luke's gospel and the fourth verse, Jesus, he told the disciples that if their brother sinned against them seven times in a day and they came and they repented each time, Jesus said to the disciples that they should forgive their brother. You see the weight of guilt, the weight of shame, they are simply too heavy for, for anybody to bear. And I tell you today that Jesus has given us the power and the authority to alleviate someone of their burdens when they have wronged us. And that's what we should do. Now, maybe I am an idealist. Maybe I am a dreamer. But I really do believe that, again, our world will be a whole lot a better place if if we live by the principles of Christ, when it came to love, when it comes to love, when it comes to grace, when it comes to mercy, when it comes to, to forgiveness, I, I believe that this world would be a better place if we truly supported one another, if we loved our neighbors. I believe, again, the world would be a better place. I believe the world would be a better place if the wrongdoer would actually acknowledge that they wronged us or that they wronged somebody else. This world, it could actually find peace. We could live in harmony. And what would we do if we had that peace and if we had that harmony, we will flourish today. As the Lord desires, we will be fruitful and we would multiply. And so as I have said before, peace and harmony, it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. There is no such thing as peace and harmony if only one party is the one that's breathing easier. So again, I say to you today that we must help each other out. Forgiveness is certainly not easy. Forgiveness, it takes effort. It takes work. But we, the peacemakers, God's children, the keepers of peace, we must be willing to put forth the effort. Will you put forth the effort today? If you will put forth the effort today, repeat after me, I will put forth the effort. I will put forth the effort. Let us put forth the effort today. And when you do that, you're going to breathe easier. When you do that, you are going to flourish. And all of those that are around you, they are going to flourish as well. Amen. 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 Hey there. Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's sermon. I hope again that you took something out of this week's sermon that you can apply it to yourself and that you can walk in it, that you can live by 
faith. Make sure that you share this week's message. Make sure you're sharing it with someone somewhere. And again, I hope that you'll come back for next week's sermon. Make sure that you're following the channel so that you don't miss the next notification for next week's sermon so that you don't miss a notification for the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies or the food for thoughts as well. Make sure that you're following the channel today.